move on uh, to uh, Ms. Jane Robbins. Ms. Jane Robbins is a senior fellow with the American Principles Project. Jane is an attorney uh, and in D.C. and in that position she has crafted federal and state legislation designed to restore the constitutional autonomy of states and parents in education policy and to protect the rights of religious freedom and conscience. She has written numerous articles about the problems with Common Core and has testified about the issues before nine different state legislatures. She's a graduate of Clemson University and the Harvard Law School. Give a Buckeye welcome to Jane Rock. got her master's degree at Ohio State, and when she was here, she, um, this was a long time ago, but she taught or worked at a small college called Otterbein, <laughs> and I used to have a t-shirt that said, Westerville, Ohio, a place to <laughs> so, I don't know whatever happened to that shirt, but anyway, she had a great two years here, she really loved it. Um, okay, I'm going to branch out a little bit beyond the standards themselves, because what the Common Core proponents will tell you is that the standards have nothing to do with data collection. You can read these standards and there'll be nothing in there about data collection, which is absolutely true. The standards themselves within the four corners of the page do not talk about data collection. However, Common Core is part of a much larger scheme than that. Um, to, to get the race to the top money, and y'all sold your souls for it in, in as did we in Georgia. I actually work at Georgia, the organizations in Washington. But um, you had to agree to adopt these standards, to adopt the national assessments that go along with the standards, and to build out your big databases, which had been in, in, um, in construction, under construction since the early 2000s. This predates the Obama administration. But um, so it's the common core. It, it's, all, it's all connected, and I'll show you a little bit how that is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Secretary Duncan said in a speech a couple of years ago <clears throat> something that I think sort of encapsulates what we're talking about here. Hopefully, some he misuses the word hopefully, but nevertheless. Um, someday we can track children from preschool to high school and from high school to college and college to career. We want to say, look at this. We want to see more states build comprehensive systems that track students from pre-K through college and then link student data to workforce data. Remember, this is a workforce development model. It is not an educational model. It is designed to build a workforce. We want to know whether Johnny participated in an early learning program and then completed college on time and whether those things have any bearing on his earnings as an adult. Um, to, to know this, what do we have to know? Everything about Johnny. Everything Johnny has ever done from the time he toddled off to preschool to the time he retires, we're supposed to know about it. The workforce development model came to a large extent in the modern era. It goes back a long way, but um, in the modern era, it came um, largely from a man named Mark Tucker, who is head of something called the National Center on Education and the Economy. And he wrote a famous or infamous letter to Hillary Clinton back in the early 90s when her husband had just been elected president saying what they should do about the education system and how they should make all this work. And he said, this is what we want to do. It should remold the entire American system for human resource development. Um, single system that goes through school, post-secondary education, and the workplace. And this is, this is the idea. And of course, if you're going to do this, you have to have data. If you're going to be planning everything that starts when kids are very young, or even in Oregon prenatally, um, and, and follow them and track them all the way through the workforce, then you have to have the data. You have to have the technology. Now, how are the, the feds involved in this? Well, and Jamie uh, alluded to this with the, with the standards themselves. The stimulus bill, which was 2009, um, which was where they you know, spent almost a trillion dollars for no apparent effect, um, plus the Race to the Top program, both of those um, bills required the states to build out these, these data systems um, in order to get Race to the Top money or in order to get under the stimulus bill something called the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund. And remember, this was a time of deep recession, and so 
Uh, the states were panicking, and they said, okay, well, we will do this. Just tell us where to sign, and they signed. So um, to get that, they had to do this. Um, now, Common Core um, is, is part of this scheme. Um, the data have to be built identically. Well, the data systems have to be built identically. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the data will go into the, the database. The Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act is the federal statute that supposedly governs student privacy. It was originally passed in 1974. Um, and, and it did protect student privacy to some extent until two years ago in January when the Obama administration gutted it by regulation, not by statute. They didn't get Congress to pass it. They passed a regu regulation, in promulgated a regulation that gutted the statute. And now under FERPA, without getting into all the details of it, now under FERPA, you can, um, whether it's the Department of Education, U.S. Department, whether it's the State Department of Education, any, any of those people, they can share personally identifiable student data with literally anyone in the world as long as they say the right words. They have to say this is in connection with an audit or evaluation of an education program. I can make anything sound like it's an audit or evaluation of an education program. So they can share it with anybody. Parents will have no right to object because parents will not know that it is happening. How is this connected with Common Core? Um, Jamie talked about the Park Assessment Consortium, which is what Ohio is still part of. Georgia used to be. We pulled out because it was going to be so exorbitantly expensive, and we said we can't afford it. Um, this is the contract that the Park Assessment Consortium has with the federal government. The, you can see the yellow things. When it, it talks about the grantee, that's Park. Um, Park will make student-level data that results from the testing system available on an ongoing basis for research, make it available to the U.S. Department of Education. When the U.S. Department wants to look at it, they can come in and look at it. Part. And down here, the other thing, the grantee, meaning part, must provide timely and complete access to any and all data collected at the state level to the U.S. Department of Education. That's what you've agreed to do. Now, what sort of data will be going to part, we don't know because they haven't said yet. Um, but your state, as the other park states did, has agreed to give part whatever they want. And that data will be made available to the U.S. Department of Education under this cooperative agreement. Okay. Um, now, the, the U.S. Department says that, um, you know, they're really not that interested in, in setting up a national database. But look at the things that they're doing. Uh, they are funding multiple initiatives to encourage interstate and interagency data sharing. You know, in my view as a parent, if the Department of Education has some information on my child, it ought to stay there. It ought not be going to the Department of Labor. It ought not be going to Health and Human Services. It ought not, whether it's within the state or whether it's at the federal level. That's education data. It's supposed to be um, for education. But the U.S. Department is funding with our money all of these things. And this is, I just picked out a few. I mean, there are dozens of these, of these initiatives that they have. Uh, workforce data quality is to, to share education data with labor data so that they can, of course, develop the workforce. Uh, common education data standards is to get the states to all use the same data standards so they can share it. Digital passport is for kids who move across state lines. Assessment interoperability framework is to, so they can share um, things about assessments across state lines. Now, what kinds of data are we talking about? Um, the National Education Data Model, which is connected with the U.S. Department of Education, recommends, it does not require yet, but it recommends the collection of over 400 data points on each child. Um, I don't know how far Ohio is down that road. Um, some states are further, have gone further than others. But um, some of, these are some of the things that, that they want to put in a child's record. And um, I mean, obviously test scores, that sort of stuff. Uh, disciplinary records, I like this. Because remember, none of this is ever going away. You know, if, if, um, if your child has a rough sixth grade year and gets suspended for a couple of days, well, it's going to be there forever. And there, it's, it's the end of the clean slate because if the child moves to a different school, um, in their view, everybody at that school now should be able to see everything the child has ever done. So, you know, I mean, I personally know people in my very own family who were awfully glad they had a clean slate when they went to a new school. Um, <laughs> but that, that's going to be gone. So now they want to see everything that's ever happened. It will stay there forever. And so all these things... Um, 
Uh, some states collect social security numbers and use them routinely as, as identifiers. They're not supposed to, but they or they have a, a system based on the social security numbers. Sources of income, um, uh, life insurance, I mean, all this stuff, it, you can, it just goes on and on and on. Everything they can think of, they put in there. And the states are expected, they're not required yet, but they are expected to build out towards that. Um, now, one thing that they're telling us, I wonder if I'm... Yeah, okay, we'll get that in a second. One thing that they tell us is that we don't have to worry about this because all of this data will be anonymized, right? <laughs> You're so cynical. <laughs> you can trust um, yeah. Every time I say that, especially people in the audience who work in the um, uh, technology area, just laugh. So you can't anonymize it. Um, and there's a, a very good law review article written by Paul Ong who talks about the problems with anonymization. And uh, he says that utility and privacy of data are goals that are at war with one another. If the data it, are useful, they cannot be anonymized. You cannot protect anonymization because the more data points you have, the more you can data match. And you, can, if you know the kid's um, uh, date of birth, you don't know his name, but then you know other things such as whether he has an IEP or whether he's on free lunch or you know that sort of what grade is he in. Uh, and there are all sorts of examples in the education world of where they have been able to data match and identify kids with upwards of 80, 85, 90 percent, 100 percent accuracy. And if you're collecting 400 or anywhere close to 400 data points, data matching is not a problem. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, now I mentioned that under the um, the to, to get money into the state fiscal stabilization fund, the states had to agree to to build their um, their data systems identically. Um, they have to to follow these twelve elements of this other act that was passed some time ago. Um, so now, why would they be doing that? Why do they require that the state data systems all be the same. Well, we'll find, here we go. Because there is a federal statute that prohibits the federal government from maintaining a national student database. Is it starting to make sense? If you've got identical databases in all 57 states, <laughs> you can share them. student database, and that was an objection to these FERPA regulations that came out a couple of years ago, and the, and the U.S. Department said, oh, we have no intention of doing this, why would we do this? Um, if the states decide to share it, that's their business, and we know the states always operate independently of the federal government, don't we? Okay, now, where are we going with this? There's, there are various aspects of all this that I want to talk about, but um, I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with this report that came out from the U.S. Department of Education a little over a year ago. It's called Promoting Grit, Tenacity, and Perseverance. Um, by the way, if, if, if you were to withdraw from PARC, because sometimes legislators will say, oh, we'll just get out of the, uh, the, the assessments, the national assessments, and then we don't have that cooperative agreement to worry about so that it, it solves the problem. No, it doesn't. You can talk to the people in Texas who are not even in Common Core, much less one of the national assessments, and they will tell you that the U.S. Department is very, very aggressive, much more so than it used to be, about demanding personally identifiable data on students. And because they are, are doing all of these, these other programs that are requiring states to do everything identically, um, they're going to get the data. They're not investing this kind of money into something. All they have to do is attach federal money to it, and the states will roll over. That's been my experience. But anyway, okay, back to this report. Promoting grit, tenacity, and perseverance. Grit is the new word. That's a new buzzword for Common Core um, in the whole Common Core scheme, that you, you can't just know stuff. You have to be this gritty person who's going to, you know, when you fall down, you get up and all, you know, which is all fine. I don't have a problem with that. But what they say is that um, this is one of these 21st century skills. Because common Core is not, one thing you have to, to understand to understand any of this is that Common Core is not about acquiring knowledge. That's not, that's not it. This, if, it, if any of you remember outcome-based education from 20 years ago, where the parents rose up in protest, Common Core is outcome-based education. It's exactly the same thing. 
they, call, they don't call it outcomes now, they call it competencies. But if you hear that word, that, it's outcome-based education, which means they're not that interested in content, they're interested in, in drilling the kid over and over and over again until he finally spits out what you want him to say. And it's not so much about content as it is about skills. It's about collaboration and consensus and all these other things that all start with C for some reason. But these are the 21st century <laughs> skills that they've got to have, and that's much more important than actually knowing anything. So this report talks about that um, because, of course, the U.S. Department thinks that's all wonderful. That's what we need to be doing since we're going into the 21st century. And if you're going to be... Um, promoting these, these different skills, you have to be able to measure it, right? Okay. I wonder if I'm turning it off accidentally. Maybe not. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, all right. So this report says some of the most promising new directions are educational data mining and effective computing. Now, effect, they didn't misspell it. That's you, the first thing you see, you think they misspelled it. They didn't. Effective doesn't, well, okay, we'll talk about what effective means. This is what effective means. Discrete emotions, particularly relevant to reactions to challenge, such as interest, frustration, anxiety, and boredom, may be measured through analysis of facial expressions, EEG brainwave patterns, skin conductance, heart rate variability, posture, and eye tracking. And in case you wonder how would one do that, on page 44 of this report, sometimes I have people in the audience who will yell out, page 44, and I say, yes, you've read the report. They put these helpful pictures on there. A facial expression camera, posture analysis, pressure mouse, I guess if you're you know, stressed over your test or whatever, you're grasping the mouse. Uh, wireless skin conductance sensor. And these are pictures that they, that they put on, on there um, to tell you what it's going to look like. Um, it looks like we're going to Okay. Now, <clears throat> am I saying that once the part test goes into effect, because it hasn't gone into effect yet, I mean, you may be in, what, trials or something right now, pilot things, but the test itself has not gone into effect. Am I saying that once that happens, that your kids are going to be hooked up to these things? No. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, because that's not going to, it's obviously not going to happen, but, at least not for now. <laughs> um, what I'm saying is that it is very important for you as parents, as citizens, as Americans, to understand the mindset of the people who are running this show. And their mindset is that they can spend many thousands of dollars doing that report, promoting grit, tenacity, and perseverance, and putting it on their website as something that's okay. The report is about 120 some odd pages, and as I recall, there may be one paragraph that talks about the possible problems with privacy. Most of the problems that they identify with this is that this whole thing of measuring all of these things is not practical for the classroom yet. That's what they said. It's not yet practical for the classroom. So that's the mindset, and we'll talk a little bit more because we get to the second report, which came in about the same time. This one has a title that I still haven't figured out. It's the, I never can remember it because it's the most bizarre arrangement of words. Mm -hmm. Expanding evidence approaches for learning in a digital... What is expanding evidence approach? I don't know. Anybody know what that means? That's weird. Anyway, this came out about the same time. This is called the KTOR report because um, it was, the main person who did it was named Karen KTOR, and she was one of the big data gurus at the... U.S. Department of Education. And this report talks about digital learning. Now, when, when we're talking about digital learning, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, when there's a great professor um, who, who is going to teach a course in something or other, or another really good teacher who's going to teach German and your school doesn't offer German so the kids can, can go online and learn the German. That's not what we're talking about. That's all wonderful. What we're talking about is the digital platforms that the public education system is just... Um, salivating over. They think this is the greatest thing in the world because um, it's, it's the ones where you prop the kid in front of a computer and then the, the child gets a prompt and has to give a response. And gets another prompt and gets another response. Like Pavlov. And, you know, goes back and forth. Um, this is, it's, it's outcome-based education. That's exactly what it is. But when they're doing um, 
that sort of interaction in those digital platforms. This is what happens, and that's what this report is about. The new digital learning resources are sophisticated systems capable of collecting large amounts of fine-grained data. And you'll see that phrase over and over again when you read about this. As users interact with them, learners will generate vast quantities of data. Um, meaning that they can look at, well, I'll, I'll show you a quote in a minute, but they can tell by the way a child interacts with the platform. How long does it take him to do this particular problem? Does he go back to this problem? How much time does he spend on this one versus that one? The idea is to get inside his head and see exactly what he's doing, exactly what he's thinking, and to predict what he will do. Um, and it says, this report says, these deeper learning objectives align with the common core standards and the next generation science standards. And I don't know what, have y'all done next generation science? Oh. Okay. Okay, the school board member is saying no. I, I don't, okay, if whatever, whether, you know, whether they're trying or not, don't let them do it. But that, that's, a, that's, another, um, that's another talk that I won't get into tonight. Um, but the deeper learning objectives, see, see, Common Core, the reason they have to teach bizarre math, they say, is, is deeper learning objectives. It's some of the, there's no buzzword left behind, and that's one of them. And, the <laughs> common, and so the, this report says, we com, this is what Common Core requires, so we're going to do all of this digital learning, because this just fits in beautifully with all of that. Um, and this is what they're doing. They measure non-cognitive aspects because they're not interested in what kids know. Remember, that's not the importance. We're not concerned about whether they know anything about Shakespeare or really know anything about algebra. We're concerned about the way they respond to these things. Um, they can measure collaboration, persistence, leadership by capturing micro-level data on problem-solving sequences, knowledge, and strategy use. Select, including the student's selections or inputs, the number of attempts he makes, the number of hints and feedback given, the time allocated. Every time, it's just, it is just generating enormous quantities of data. Um, they can track that. This report talks about this great idea of tracking students across um, all sorts of educational settings and combine it with educational or with data from other agencies, whether it's social services, whether it's juvenile justice, whether any of that. So we can, we can figure out all the behaviors. It's all about behaviors. Um, so this report talks about that. This is one thing that I liked about it. They, they talk about these great experiments that are going on all over the country. This is the University of Massachusetts is combining data from sensory and detect learners' facial expressions and physical activity with data from the intelligent tutoring system, the weighing outpost, to identify in real time whether a learner is feeling excited, confident, frustrated, or bored. And there are also people who say, we could, we could do teacher evaluations this way. We could track, uh, you think I'm kidding? There is, I hate to say this, I'm ashamed to say this, but my alma mater, Clemson University, has a grant from the Gates Foundation to study skin conductance. And it was originally set up as a program to measure teacher effectiveness by seeing what the, the physiological reaction of the students is. And then when that created an outcry, then the Gates people said, oh, no, 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 it wasn't anything about teacher effectiveness. That, it had nothing to do with that. Just forget all of that, you know, ignore the man behind the curtain. But that's what they're doing. Um, this is my favorite one. This is my absolute favorite one. This is also from the same report. There's something called Class Dojo, or I don't know where that came from. A real-time behavior management tool. Students receive the feedback on their positive and negative behaviors in real time. A positive behavior is acknowledged with a chime and a green badge that appears on the student's avatar, and a negative behavior is marked by a buzzer and a red badge. Does this bother anybody but me? I mean, please. Excuse me? Oh, <laughs> well, we can talk about that then. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention, um, okay, so that's where the digital stuff is going, and you will see every Chamber of Commerce meeting that talks about education bringing in all of these digital education companies saying, look, we can transform education. Anytime you hear the word transform, <laughs> hide the silver, because they are, they're thinking about a transformation that's real different from the one that you're thinking about. Um, now, I just wanted to mention this because this has come up a lot in Georgia because they killed our bill, our student privacy bill. Um, a, a lot of schools, and I don't know how much this is happening in Ohio, but I imagine it is, are, are getting um, uh, offers 
from Google, and maybe from Microsoft as well, I don't know the other places, um, to, to let them have this free stuff, these free education apps. You can use their, their um, documents, you can use you know, Google Docs, you can use the email and all this stuff, and they give it to the schools free, and they say, isn't this great? We're getting all of this free stuff. How is Google giving you free stuff? <laughs> One reason, the, the, um, the less uh, disturbing reason, is that it gets students used to using Google. So, you know, when they eventually they become Google customers just because that's what they know. Okay, well, fine. But the other reason is that they're scanning it. They're scanning every email. They're scanning everything they get from every student. And they're using it for their targeted advertising. We all know that happens if you have a Gmail account. You know, every time you send an email, then you get all these little things that pop up about whatever you said in the email, which is really spooky. But they're doing that with student emails as well. And they claim that, oh, but the, you know, Google says, Google's being sued right now in California over this. And, um, and they say, well, and they admit now that, that even in their apps for education that they're doing that as well. But they say, well, the schools understand that, and the schools have given us permission, and it's the school's responsibility to get permission from the parents and to let them know that this is going on. Maybe so. How many of y'all have been told that this is what they're doing? And uh, Maybe the schools are supposed to be getting permission, but most students, and, you know, all, all you hear, all the parents hear is, look at this generous corporate donor that has given us all this free stuff, Right? So this is going on as well. Um, this is, was also from the same um, article. They're believing that Google's using the emails as well as students' internet searches and other information to create online profiles of students that could haunt them for years, especially when we know that there are people out there at the highest levels of government who are looking at what people do and maybe auditing them because of what they do. Um, this, <laughs> no, it wouldn't happen. Can't happen here. This is from Eric Schmidt, who's the... the head honcho at Google. Uh, with your permission, you give us more information about you, about your friends, and we can improve the quality of our searches. We don't need you to type at all. We know where you are. We know where you've been. We can more or less know what you're thinking about. And the U.S. Department of Education says that's what we want. We want to know what the students are thinking. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a uh, conference in Washington. I'm at the end now. Um, that was at the U.S. Department of Education. It was called Data Palooza. Uh, by the way, it was moderated by a guy who was the chief technology officer. And he's now the chief te technology officer of the White House. Before that, he was the technology guy at the Department of Health and Human Services. I mean, you really can't make this stuff up, right? So he was the, his name is Todd Park, but he was the, um, the, the moderator. But anyway, they brought in all these digital education guys uh, to come in, and one of them was named Sean Bates from eScholar. I bet a lot of schools in Ohio are using eScholar as well. And he says, we collect billions of records of data. We're pulling data from everywhere, tens of thousands of places. He's talking about that fine grained data. Common Core is the glue that ties everything together. Why is that? Because Common Core is outcome-based education. It is the way they're going to get the digital platforms into the schools because they go so well with these outcome-based standards. That's what's going on. So, um, I'm at the end of my time now, so um, just wanted to let you know sort of what the, the lay of the land is, and when someone tells you that Common Core has absolutely nothing to do with data collection or data sharing, um, oh, wow. oh, somebody wanted to know, well, can because opt-out is becoming a huge thing, and can you opt out of giving this data, and, and my, my evasive answer is that I don't know what Ohio law says about opt-out. What, what most states say is nothing, because it never really occurred to the people who wrote these laws and the people who wrote No Child Left Behind and who wrote you know, all these other federal laws, it never really occurred to them that, that parents would not be sheep and just roll over and do whatever they're told. I would say, you know, if it were my child, my children, it's easy for me to say because my kids are older and not in school anymore, but um, when they ask for the intrusive stuff, I'm not the you know, the digital learning stuff, and I would say, I, I would like to opt my child out of the digital learning. But as far as giving them information about all, you know, those 400 data points, um, I, I would say, no, why do you need it? And show me where you need it, and show me where the statute is that says that you get it. Otherwise, I would opt out and make them. And of course, that, as, I, as I say, it's easy for me to say because it's my, not my child who's going to be targeted, perhaps, if they do that. But there's safety in numbers. If you can get a lot of parents who say, mm -mm, we're not going to do this. You just have to. Usually, at least in other areas of the country, we've seen them back off and say, well, okay, it sort of messes up our system, but okay. But it's, um, 
it's an interesting development, and we'll see where it goes. But good luck. Thank you.